Hey, Mason. Hello, Josh. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for asking. What about you? I am doing excellently. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure. You are basically from United States, right? No, I'm from Canada. Canada. Okay. Cool. Yes, I'm Very Canadian. close to America. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same continent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The same continent. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So let's yeah. just dive into the questions. Okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, teacher Josh, mm -hmm. uh, speaking of motivation, how can we motivate language learners? What do you think about this? Very good. Um, I think this is an interesting question because I find motivation is not really something that we can give to somebody else, but it's something that's really found from within ourselves. We have to cultivate it ourselves. However, as English teachers, I do think it is important to be a source of inspiration. So in order to inspire students to find that motivation, I think some things that English teachers can do is to lead by example. For example, what I mean by that is that we share our own experiences in learning in order to show the student that it is possible to reach their goals in learning, as well as to show students how it is possible to strategize in order to reach a more concrete goal. And to actually something that I find very important is providing honest but constructive criticism and feedback because I find English learners often focus on their weaknesses and on their, you know, things, mistakes that they keep doing over and over and over, and that can become quite demotivating. So as teachers, I think it's important to show the student their, process, their progress, to show them their strengths, to say, hey, look, you used to do this, but now you do this. This is great. You have shown progress and you are reaching your goal and you will accomplish what you need. And I think that sort of inspiration can help the student to foster motivation. Fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastic, very nice. Okay, speaking of different ages or let's say uh, levels, what is the difference between young learners and adults? Well, I would say there's a lot of differences when it comes to them when um, you're talking about language learning. Um, definitely time. Children have a lot more time than adults do. They have less responsibilities, less priorities. They definitely have school depending on their age, but even outside of school they have that time to devote to learning a language if they need. And what I think is interesting is that with young learners they have more of the natural sense to immerse themselves in a language because they incorporate the language with their friends or family, they incorporate it with their playtime. Um, if they're learning it from a child, you know, it is being taught to them during those developmental stages where they act as sponges and absorb all that information. Whereas adults, we have to prioritize time. We have to make time and make an effort in order to immerse ourselves. It does not happen naturally. So I think in those ways, there's a lot of difference between adults and um, young learners. There are both pros and cons, but they're definitely different experiences. Exactly. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so I, I received this question a lot. That is why I put it in the you mm -hmm. know, interview questionnaire. It says here, what are the probable problems of students while they are studying and learning? Mm -hmm. um, and sort of complaint or yeah i don't know yeah. any sort of just nagging or i don't know maybe you faced with such students a lot yeah i would say probably uh, um how do i stay motivated <laughs> i feel like that's something that students often ask me and i think a lot of it has to do with um, a learner not understanding the learning process i feel like because it is a language and it is something that is so innate in human beings to communicate, um, learners often feel like it should be a skill that is immediately attained, but it's not. It's like any other skill. If you want to learn how to do math, it's gonna take time to learn math. If you wanna to learn to play an instrument, it's gonna take time, just like learning English. It's going to take time and practice. And I think one way that they can understand this is through that strategy that strategizing um, in order to reach their goals, as well as to understand that 
you know, being at the beginning stages of learning a language is different from being in the middle or at the end. You know, at the beginning, you know nothing. So everything is new and exciting to you and you're absorbing tons and tons of new information. But then you're gonna reap that little, you know, plateau period where, you know, you're not going to be learning as many things as often, but that doesn't mean that you're not learning. It's just a different stage of the learning process. And I think understanding that can really help a learner stay motivated because they know that this is normal and it has nothing to do with their intelligence, nothing to do with their capability, etc. It's a common human experience. Excellent. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really. Um, okay. Generally speaking, what sort of material? Yeah. Question number three. What sort of material would you recommend them to use? Uh, basically like books, apps, websites, mm -hmm. uh, or digital platforms, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Well, what's great now in this day and age is we have so many resources. Um, I particularly like Quizlet for vocabulary, um, not only because it's a digital flashcard and we can customize it, but also for its diversification purposes. So I think when one is learning a language, one needs to diversify. Otherwise, one is going to get super bored or they're going to get demotivated once again, right? So if you can vary the content that you are learning and the format that you are learning it in, it can make it more exciting and fun for you. So I think Quizlet is a good way for that because it has like eight different ways that you can learn that vocabulary. And then there's multiple ways that they gamify the vocabulary too to make it like a video game. So it's great in my opinion. Um, and when it comes to other skills like writing or conversation, I would say italki is really good for conversation um, as well as writing. You can get feedback quite quickly. Hi Native is a great app too. It's almost instantaneous feedback when you have a question, which is great. And like you said, books. Reading is extremely important. That's one of my favorites. And I think learning um, how reading can help your vocabulary is important because, you know, there are different types. You know, if you read the news, great for the everyday conversation, for small talk, education, environment, religion, politics, etc. Nonfiction is great if you want to sound more professional or learn vocabulary that's more academic. And fiction is great if you want to know how to express your emotions and feelings, how to describe your personality, your friends' personalities, your surroundings, etc. So I think focusing on these different areas and diversifying can help you a lot, definitely. Awesome, fantastic, <laughs> really. Um, okay, very cliche question. Grammar and vocabulary. Yes. <laughs> which one is important <laughs> and why, big why? Uh -huh. And how can, of course, obviously learners improve their grammar and vocabulary? I receive this question a lot. Yeah, I I'm do sure that you well. receive that too. Yeah, it is a very common question. Not a lot of learners like grammar, so I think that's why it's often asked. Um, but to be honest, I think they exist hand in hand. You know, I think they're both important. I think vocabulary is important because we need to have words to communicate. But even though those words have individual meaning, if we put them in a random order, their meaning is lost and it's no longer understood. And with grammar, grammar cannot exist if it has nothing to structure. So it needs that vocabulary to organize. So I think they come hand in hand. However, when it comes to me teaching my students, I always recommend learning vocabulary first, some basic expressions. And then once they get more advanced, more familiar with that, then we can incorporate the grammar to show you, look, you already know this because you know this expression and this is how it works. And now this is how we can apply it in other circumstances. So it becomes a little bit um, natural, more natural and easier in that way, I think. Fantastic, really <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, very silly question to ask from a native speaker. Okay. How did you personally learn English? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, since I am a native speaker, my parents taught it to me and it was reinforced with, you know, Canadian society and the schooling system. However, um, before I even entered school, I did already know how to read and write, um, which is unusual. 
And the reason why is because my parents use this like activity kit, if you want to call it, called Phonics. I don't know if it still exists, um, but it was really great because it was basically different activities for children related to coloring and stickers and things. And it used sound in order to associate it to visual memory um, using mnemonics. And it helped me a lot with my spelling and my writing and my reading. And it made it so that I was a little bit higher than the other students when I first started school. So I think that was kind of a unique experience that not always native speakers have because none of my friends did phonics. <laughs> But it was fun. <laughs> yeah, sure. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, is it possible to learn multiple languages simultaneously? Mm -hmm. And would you recommend doing that? I think it's definitely possible. I've done it. I'm currently doing it. Um, I would recommend it. However, I would only recommend it to a student depending on their circumstance. So it depends on what their goals are. Each language that is learned usually has a different goal. They're not always the same. Um, and depending on that goal, that will depend on how far one goes or when one should begin. And I don't think that one should learn multiple languages at the exact same level. If you're an absolute beginner in everything, then that's not a good idea. You're going to confuse things. Things are going to be, yeah, everything is unfamiliar to you. Therefore, it's harder for your brain to compartmentalize these different languages. So I think if you are in, uh, at a different stage in each language, it's easier. For example, in my experience, when I was learning, um, well, I well, learned right? French. Yeah, I learned <laughs> French. <laughs> Very, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's quite common in Canada. So I learned French, and once I reached a B2 level in French, I started learning Swedish. And then once I reached around a B1 level in Swedish, I started learning Spanish. I had a a uh, much um, greater goal with Spanish, so I reached further than that. And then once I reached an upper intermediate to advanced level in Spanish, that's when I incorporated Portuguese. And so I have all these languages going at the same time, but they're all different levels. And I think that's what helps avoid confusion. Great, mm -hmm. awesome. Really awesome. Uh, okay, it says, how can learners improve their speaking ability, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm literally going to kill myself, you know, <laughs> receiving this question, really. It, it is a very common question of mine. Yeah, learners, exactly. That's for sure. Disturbingly common. <laughs> I think it's because people want a, a you know, a trick, a special trick. But yeah, there's magic. no... Yeah, magic. They want it to be immediate. But unfortunately, that's not how life works. It's, it's just practice. If you want to be able to speak, well, speaking is just like reading. You didn't know how to read as soon as you came out of the womb. You had to learn how to do that. And the same with speaking. So it's a separate skill that needs to be practiced separately. And you can do that by creating opportunities for yourself. You can do that by, you know, getting a tutor, a language exchange partner, by speaking aloud when you're at home. We all think in our heads. Why not think outside of your head? narrate what you're doing. If you're cooking, tell yourself what you're doing in English. That can practice your vocabulary with food, with recipes, with activities related to the kitchen, with furniture in the kitchen, etc. Do that when you're showering. You can practice the vocabulary Singing. for your body parts. Yeah, exactly. For hygiene and cleaning. So if you just speak out loud and you create these opportunities for you, it will strengthen your ability to speak because you are, you know, you're taking your muscles to the gym in your face and you're strengthening those muscles and it will get easier for you to move those muscles in the English way so that it will be easier for you to communicate when the time comes. Very nice, really cool, really cool. And uh, so accent and or versus mm -hmm. pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Plus American English, British English or other forms of English. What do you think about <laughs> this cliche question? Um, uh, I would say that pronunciation is definitely important because pronunciation is different in every language. So if we apply our native language's um, phonetic system onto English, you might not be understood. So it's important to learn how English letters are pronounced. However, that being said, an accent I think is beautiful. Many, most native English speakers love accents. They think they're really interesting. And I think it shows 
you know, who someone is and where they're from. It is a part of their personality and their character. And I think it's beautiful. Um, the only time that I Which think- Which one is your favorite? Sorry my for favorite? Um, I Canadian. Would, I would, <laughs> <laughs> um, not Canadian accent, that's for sure. Um, I would say my favorite accent would be probably Cockney. I really Sorry? like the Cockney from the UK. It's a particular really? English accent in the UK. Um, probably an unpopular opinion, but I think it's really unique. <laughs> so I really like it. Um, so that's what I would say probably. Um, and when it comes to choosing which accent to learn, I think again, that depends on the learner's goals. So if- Is that a must? Sorry? To Sorry? choose an accent as a student. Is that a necessity? Um, I think like if you have your natural accent being shown, I think that's okay. But I think it is important to choose a pronunciation system which would be related to the accent in English. And the reason why is because if there's a lot of words that are shared among the different English variants. For example, words that exist in British English and also North American English, but have completely different meanings. And so if you mix up the accents and let's say, you know, 80% of the way that you pronounce things is very much North American, but then 20% is British, then when that random British word comes in, which sounds, you know, it also exists in North American English, and you mean it with a British uh, definition, people won't understand it with the British definition. They'll understand it with the North American um, definition. Um, and that happens with a lot of different words. So it's good to create some sort of consistency. But that being said, if your natural accent shows through, that's okay. But I think when it, learn, when it comes to learning the accents of the English variants, I think consistency is important because that will change meaning. Does that make sense? Of course, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, people are so obsessed with, uh, you know, accent stuff. Yeah. Everybody has an accent, which is just really cool. Yeah. Everybody should have an accent mm -hmm. naturally. Okay, it says, um, is it possible to learn English without going abroad? Certainly, certainly. I think if you immerse yourself, then you can certainly learn English without going abroad. And what I mean by immersion is just, you know, living your language. It is taking your language away from being a hobby or a chore and making it a lifestyle. So change all of your electronic devices into English, your operating systems, your computers, your tablets, your phones, etc. cetera. Change, change your video games into English if you play video games, your books, your movies, TV shows, etc. your music. And if you do this, then you're doing all of the things that you enjoy, but now you're just doing it in English. So you're immersing yourself. And that makes it much easier and more natural. Definitely, you mm -hmm. know, fantastic. And uh, question, okay, how long will it take for a person to really learn every necessary elements of language to speak it properly? Yes. So this is an interesting question, question. because <laughs> it is very subjective on many levels. <laughs> sure, sure. Meaning what does speak properly mean and you know, what are the necessary elements? Um, in my opinion, time should not be something that is really focused on when learning English, because if you focus on time, you're not focusing on the content. You're not focusing on the process or the progress that you're making. And instead, you are stressing yourself out unnecessarily, and it's no longer becoming fun, and that immediately becomes demotivating. So I, I don't typically like to set time, and I don't think that there is a set time, because every learner is different, too. Depending on how the learner approaches their language learning with English, that will change the time, too. How consistent are they? How motivated are they? What are they doing? What is their strategy? Um, what are their priorities? Do they have goals? Do they not have goals? Etc. So there's a huge range of time that it could take. So I, in my opinion, there's not really a set time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Of course, uh, very uh, interesting question. And uh, <laughs> the final question is technology and education. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that the 
uh, integration of these two, mm -hmm. I don't know how to call it, factors, elements, or whatever, uh, or ideas, can be a good idea or can be a harmful idea? I think it's quite, quite positive, actually. Um, of course, there are some Totally stars. positive? Sorry? Is that totally positive? Oh, of course not. Nothing is totally positive. There are definitely are some negative aspects, meaning you could get distracted. So it's all about your discipline and, you know, you setting boundaries for yourself as a learner. Um, and I think, you know, technology has improved education in a lot of ways because it has opened things up to more people. It has globalized knowledge as opposed to kept it more, you know, nationalized, if you will. Um, and it also provides people the opportunity to learn English when maybe they didn't have the ability to learn English and they have more content in English. So now there's a higher likelihood of them being able to find their interests in the English language. So overall, I would say it is more positive, but yes, there are some cons to it as well. Fantastic, mm -hmm. sir. Uh, it was really cool, actually. Uh, your answers were really unique, so to speak. Oh, really? And oh, I am oh, really grateful. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Uh, of course, you know, every single uh, teacher, native speaker, non-native speaker, has, uh, of course, some valuable knowledge, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But your answers were really unique, so to speak, honestly speaking. Oh. I am, again, really wow. uh, grateful, <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I definitely appreciate you having me and inviting me to share my experiences as well as my opinion and knowledge and methodologies. <laughs> Why not? You know, as you said, you know, we are in a sort of uh, uh, technology bound or driven, you know, uh, society mm -hmm. or era. And mm -hmm. uh, we definitely need to use these technology, right? Zoom, yeah, other yeah. places, you know, uh, YouTube, this and that. Why not? Mm -hmm. You know, interviewing teachers can be a good choice. Even for myself, mm -hmm. of course, I'm learning from multiple uh, and, uh, you know, various teachers. Ideas yeah. are important, yeah. you know. Uh, let's mm -hmm. say, let's say this interview just took like, let's say half an hour, okay? Mm -hmm. This half an hour is really valuable, so mm -hmm. to speak, which means that, I mean, it has a lot of <clears throat> great, uh, uh, how can I say, effort, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, time and research and, uh, you know, knowledge, experience, everything. Mm -hmm. That is why I really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, no problem. I think it's a great series that you've created on YouTube here because it's, it's great for students and teachers alike. They, we can all learn from one another. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure, sir. My pleasure. So thank you very much for this interview and have a good time and uh, stay uh, calm. Yes, and stay safe. healthy and well <laughs> in these crazy times. I hope you enjoy your evening. It's evening there, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you have a good night. And thank you we'll very much. talk to you hopefully next time. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you then. See you later. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.